Hello, this is John with Coach.Win, and I'm super excited to have Shelly Schultz. I've known Shelly for I don't know, almost a decade now, I believe, and I got introduced by another leading business person in Omaha, Nebraska. And Shelly came on board for me to be my CEO and integrator, so I'm super excited about that. Shelly, welcome to Coach.Win's uh, podcast, and uh, why don't you give a background for the audience so they know a little bit about you. Thanks, John. Uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, as John mentioned, my background is heavily in, in uh, operations and um, have several decades of experience. Um, I had really developed a passion for operations right out of college. Um, I started with my uh, an organization that I stayed with for almost 18 years. Um, but it really helped me develop like a mindset for process improvement for development of people. Uh, I had some great coaches and mentors along those um, in that organization, and um, it really taught me what right looked like from a business standpoint. That's great. So you started in the process and operations. Was there a moment or something like that where you said like, wow, I'm starting to really enjoy like the let's move over to like the lead, manage, hold people accountable side? Or is there time in there you're like, I'm starting to enjoy people because I know you are passionate about that. Yeah, I mean, there was. I mean, I, I, I'll i tell you, you know, the same, same career, um, same job that I'd stayed with for 18 years. I mean, it was a bunch of us, uh, I would call us kids. We were all like between the ages of uh, 21 and 25, and we were all heavily motivated. We, we worked for an organization that had high discipline, high expectations, and um, it was clear that while we were working for the company and we were driving results for the organization, we were really showing up for each other. And that's what made it incredibly fun um, and also very rewarding. Um, none of us uh, wanted to let each other down. We, we knew our lanes. We all knew what we needed to accomplish to, to put the win on the scoreboard. And I think through through all of that, you know, you keep growing and developing and, and you're taking on new things. I really became passionate about it um, when I started winning as an individual. And I think that's really, um, really prevalent. It's, it's, you know, it's rewarding. You're starting to get promotional opportunities. Now you're kind of known as the person that can be pulled from one thing to another to go fix it. And I really found joy in that. It really, it, it was very fulfilling. And I think largely, if, I'm, if I were to attribute some of Kind of the way I think about business is the same way I thought about um, being in athletics. Um, you know, you're you're with a team, you're winning as a team. Um, you have a responsibility to your team to do your best and to show up every day. And uh, and really, when you're able to accomplish things in business, and you know that you're the person that people are looking toward to go help solve problems, that was how I put up my points on the scoreboard. Um, and that's how I could win as an individual. All, all the while, we're all winning together. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's get into the role as COO, integrator, depending on what term people are using. And that's what you were for me and you've been for several uh, or a couple other firms as well. What are some of the challenges you're seeing? Because that's a, it's a unique role as, you know, as an owner of a company, this, this role you're managing in every direction. At, at CEO, from peers to direct reports to up. Like, so what are you seeing as some of the challenges in that specific role? For the role itself, it's just really, you know, I, I think the biggest challenge that I've run into is really the, the the holistic understanding of, say, the EOS platform. So you have an integrator that is working with the visionary of the organization, and they're there to make sure that all areas of the organization are held accountable. I think the biggest challenge in the EOS model is, um, I think, in practice, it gets really difficult when you have uh, your peers that are also reporting up to the visionary um, that don't necessarily want to be held accountable by someone outside of their boss. And unless that philosophy and theory is really driven down um, from the very top, I think I think you do run into challenges. I think you you know obviously. Um, a part of a great team is being a good team member, and and sometimes direction, um, you know, direction and influence is it is can be difficult if not everybody is aligned with what that role can do for the organization. 
Yeah, and I know that is definitely a, a challenge, and I, I see that uh, across some of my uh, clients. I do know, and I'll talk from my own experience too. Sometimes, and you had to do this on me, so I'm quite willing to share about the experience I had with you, and I thought you did a great job with it. Is me as a visionary, and maybe you have some other examples where I think I'm just helping, but I go talk to the marketing team, or I go talk to my warehouse distribution team, way off target, and I and I take them. You know, all of a sudden, I'm thinking I'm asking them to do a one-hour project, and they start running down a three-day pass, right? Because mm -hmm. as the visionary, I'm just going, 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 going. And you helped me understand how much I was disrupting the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. Tell me the challenges about managing up to a visionary. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it's the you know, um, it, it's the fatal flaw, and it's the best thing of visionaries um, and business owners. I mean, you guys are thinking a million miles a minute. You're kicking out great business ideas. Um, you know, faster than most people can have a single thought. Um, and that can be challenging to manage because you have a passion to bring all of those things to life can be very distracting, especially if you have a direct line to um, associates this, that really want to please you. And I think that is the misnomer in the whole thing. Like um, for you, John, you're thinking, hey, it, I'm just me. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing incredibly special about me. I'm going to go have a talk with this employee. Well, no, they see you differently. They see you as somebody that, um, first of all, that they highly respect and they want to please you. That is very natural for um, employees to, to want to do that. And so if you don't understand the power that you have when you are even suggesting something spitballing, ideation um, with one of your employees, it can really take them off target. And I think to your point, like how many times had, did I walk in your office and I say, did you have this conversation with this person? And you're like, no, I was just, it was just an idea. I had, there was no directive. And I'm like, nope, they are off and running. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I just think that, you know, um, just being cautious about the, the, the actual responsibility and the power that you have as an owner or visionary and have on other people and how that could be disrupting to, you know, your, your, your daily targets, your quarterly goals, your annual goals. Yeah. I think I, uh, just thinking back, I could kind of tell how much I, uh, distract as somebody by how lo loud the door slammed behind you as you're walking into my office to say like, <laughs> 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 what did you just do to my, uh, team? like, uh, I could tell that uh, I did something uh, incorrect, I guess, would be the way to think about it. And, uh, you know, it is amazing. Your statement is so true. For me, I'm just me. Hey, maybe I, did this, I went to this conference. You should check out this new thing I learned and look yeah. at this. And then I had no idea that I distracted the group as much as I did and, and how I did take them away from their weekly and whatever. And it, because just when I do strategy planning, we want people to win weekly, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. And all of a sudden, and as visionary, if I distracted them for three days, all of a sudden they're not winning. And I, that has never been my intent as a visionary, but I didn't know what I was doing. And you really helped me uh, see that side of me. So let, let, let's move to something else that I run into a lot right now, which is, you know, when I get involved with clients, one of the things I want to do is I ask about their one-on-one -on -one rhythm. And one of the things I get is like, look, I'm talking to my people all the time. I, I talk to them three times a day. I see them in whether the hallway or on a Teams meeting or on a Zoom meeting, but I'm checking in with them all the time. So I guess I don't understand why I need to do like one-on-ones. Tell me your philosophy on one-on-ones and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first thing, one-on-ones is are your it's your employees' time with you, um, and so that should be honored. Um, even though you're checking in, there's no formality in it. I, I agree. I, I like to talk to my employees multiple times during the week and check in and see how things are going. Uh, there's, there's something different about sitting down, going through where they have barriers, where they have concerns, where they may be emotionally triggered about something, um, you know, helping people get back to uh, you know, the basics and keeping their eye on the prize if they're distracted with the, with some sort of noise going on in the organization. Um, and it really, for me, it gives me a chance to really listen 
there's so much being said that isn't being verbalized during those meetings. And if you're, you know, perceptive, you can pick up on those things. Are, you know, is something happening happening at home? Or do they seem down today? Kind of pull on those threads, kind of try to understand that more. And that's not going to happen at a, you know, at a water cooler conversation. Um, so this is the formal setting, and I really believe that you know we owe that to our team members to give them that attention, that direction, coaching, mentoring. Um, but that is sacred time, in my opinion. I agree, and it's it's a very uh, very valuable. I like what you said there about the whole idea of it's like that time that way honor them, like by honoring their time, which makes them feel important. But also, it's really you can really listen. You really have set aside the time as a boss to do it. Do you have recommendations? Maybe it's different by department role, like how often this formal one on one should occur? You know, there's different philosophies. I think it 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 depends on the level that you're managing, to be honest. so if i'm if I'm managing VPs and I'm managing maybe director, senior director level, um, I like to get on it, it, it you know every other week um, cadence. Um, only because that allows for some really meaty conversation, enough time to pass where things are progressing or, um, you know, help is needed. Um, but depending on, you know, if you're, if you're a manager and you're managing the day to day and there's weekly goals that need to be met or you need to set the stage for the week ahead, um, I would prescribe a, a, a weekly one on one for those folks. Uh, some people probably won't like this next answer, but what would be the longest time you'd go between one-on-ones? Like, uh, I have some people that say like, hey, maybe every six months or every three months. Uh, no, I mean, I, I feel kind of guilty going every other week, to be honest. So that's, yeah. that's probably pushing my limits, yeah. but that's me. I just, I just think resetting and understanding um, if they're running into barriers, for sure. Um, you know, really understanding how we keep people engaged. If you're if you're waiting six months to have a one on one and like a more formal conversation, like you're missing the whole boat. They could be off and running on on stuff, especially if you don't have a cadence around like keeping track of uh, initiatives and um, uh, goals. So I mean, just it stands to reason that you should be checking in on those regardless. There are other things, you know, that's the cherry on top that you get from frequent uh, meetings with your employees. But um, I, I just, it, it would be hard to understand how a, a six, months ca- six month cadence is um, really beneficial. I totally agree, yes. But there's always, there's always a little bit of pushback for people. So um, one thing you introduced to uh, Offwire that uh, you know we had not had in the past. It was you. You do skip level meetings. Um, can you tell me just tell explain what they are for people that might not know, but also just why you think they're important for you to do those skip level meetings? Yeah, and and this one's hard because uh, this is uh, not necessarily high in the priority, right? The the philosophy of many is you know I have got I have leadership in place. They're handling uh, the folks that report to them. Um, you know, there's some philosophy about not meddling, let that leader lead and manage. And I agree with all of that, to be honest. I, I think, you know, I'm going to give you an example. So I had this uh, one person that I was working with and they said, you know, we're having a hard time ex- executing on this. Our throughput isn't fast enough. Um, It's causing us, it's eroding our margin over here because we can't redeploy people to new projects in time. And and so kind of explaining that whole thing. And my first question was, what are the people doing the work saying about the process? Because there's no better resource than the people that are actually working in the process to help you mitigate risks in that process. And to be honest, People are dying to tell you how to make their job easier, more efficient, more effective. They're they're they they're raising their hand saying, "Hey, if only if we did this, this would save us this much time." And you would be surprised at how many times people don't say a word because they're just not asked the question. So I, when there are problems in in the throughput, um, 
in in your organization, you're you're struggling in some way. Um, I always defer to going to the front line and saying, "Hey, we're we're ch we're challenged here. Does anybody have any ideas?" Um, and it's so fun to see how many people raise their hand and say, "Absolutely, I do." Um, and so I think also just um, just from a culture standpoint, I think. Um, leaders can really gain loyalty by listening and understanding. You have to set the stage though. I mean, it doesn't mean that every idea that pops up in those skip levels can be you know, executed on or they're feasible even. Um, but what you can do is you can listen and you can validate that there are great ideas coming through. And then you can do checkpoints with your managers and leaders of those departments and say, have you heard this before? What are your thoughts? This seems like it it actually might help us. You know, the other thing it does inadvertently and indirectly is it kind of keeps your leaders and managers on their toes too, yeah. um, from a culture standpoint. So, um, you know, you could also ask questions like, how are how how are we how are we executing on our core values? Do you feel good about that? How can we how can we as an organization be better? Um, what about our culture mantra? Are we living it every day? Tell us how we can be better. Um, and, and really what you wanna focus on, John, is making sure that you're going into those conversations, setting the expectation, like this is not kind of a whining session. This is very much a open forum to come up with how to make us better. So shifting that from complaining to solutions and ideas um, is magic. No, that's great. And I love it early on in the you said like we're challenged here. I think that's also just something that's authentic and real. And the managers don't have all the answers and the front lines have lots of great potential ideas. And I like how you said you, you set it up properly. Like we can't, you know, not every idea is going to happen, but the idea is to get it because they are people are passionate about wanting to make their job better and easier and faster and uh, just better for the company so everyone wins. And I do like that. It, it does. It definitely did. Uh, there was, I know some managers that I had that, you know, hey, I'm going to be talking to the team. Like, well, why are you meddling in my world? But I do think it really once people understood the positiveness about it, it became just a very natural cultural thing. So I love I love the skip level meetings. A um, couple other things I want to talk about. So we run into people always do it. It's always like, you know, this person is really good in their role and therefore they become supervisor or they get moved up to manager or whatever. And I see often when I have like, you know, the private moments with next level leaders of my clients, like, hey, the good news is I got promoted into this role. Welcome to the next level management team. I've never managed before. I have no, like, I'm lost and they, they're feeling bad. How, you know, to avoid that, how do you start ha working with executive teams and talking to people about like, hey, what are we going to do for people that are going to move up? Like, what should we be prepare these people for talk to me about that yeah and i think you said it i mean there's no secret recipe there you have to prepare you have to prepare people to take on that challenge before the promotion i mean once they're promoted and they are starting to feel like a fish out of water because they're not really understanding how to do the leadership piece i mean they could probably most likely they're very tactical or technical experts at what they're doing that led them to become you know, in, in a promotional opportunity. Um, the challenge that you really have is that, you know, once you go there, um, you know, and if not kind of trained up on what the expectations are, even how to lead, um, it really puts that person in a really um, kind of fish out of water scenario. A lot of times they're managing their peers now um, and they're they're worried that they're anxiety ridden about ruining relationships and how do I how do I maneuver this and now I'm in a position where I'm telling somebody uh, what what to do potentially um, and and how to do that without you know taking them out of their game how do how do I optimize um, what they're doing well yet be critical of the things that they need help you know. Um, or need more training on or can do better. And I think, I think, you know, having a roadmap for your employees in general is, is really germane. I mean, you have to, it's paramount. You have to understand who are, who are high potential employees, what, what their succession plan is, 
um, and then get them ready before they get there. Um, so there are systems that, you know, I, I grew up in where we, you know, we had different tiers of training, but we had to go through all those tiers before we were able to be promoted into a larger role um, that had to do with leading other humans. So um, it's really important. It's really important for that new manager. I mean, yes, they probably get a new nice shiny title and some, you know, some more coin, but you also want to protect them because obviously they're great employees. You don't want to put them in a position where they're feeling uncomfortable now, lacking confidence, wonky. Maybe they start alienating the team members. Then you have, you know, that all sorts of chaos ensues. So um, ensuring that they're prepared for that role, which is so incredibly important, um, is really a smart thing to do. And totally agree. Totally agree. The uh, world has changed, obviously, since COVID. We've gone to a combination of remote, hybrid, um, you know, in-person types of uh, meetings. How has being the you know person that's in charge of leading, manage, holding people accountable for companies? How has that changed? Any different tools you've been using? Just what do you what have you been in your feelings over these last three years? Yeah, it's kind of evolved, hasn't it? I um. I know we were really, you know, in 2020, when we all were deployed to home base, we were really worried about productivity. And, you know, some people are are amazing at working from home, more productive than they are in the office, um, really embraced it, um, really got excited about it. And you have some people that are kind of uh, floaters, you know, they're kind of in and out of their office and kind of can't stay, you know, attention or with attention to the tasks and some people just aren't made for an at-home scenario. Um, we have, you know, obviously Teams, um, Zoom was very popular out of the gate, if you recall, um, but having that face-to-face -face interaction is really important when you have work from home employees um, and making sure that they're, um, they're actually showing up camera ready. Um, because that makes sure that they absolutely are ready to take on their day. I think that was one of the things that we really implemented was like camera on mentality. Um, and then um, the other thing was uh, just having tools. So we, we implemented a tool called Active Track that allowed us to um, uh, track productivity and track where people were going. So if we saw that they were kind of getting off track or productivity was low, we could have really good meaty conversations surrounding that. That makes sense a lot. Yeah, it's been interesting. Some of the, uh, I've had some really interesting discussions with some of my owners that there's some people that are very, very productive at home, like way more than they were at work. Often they were kind of more introverts and the idea of people walking up to their keyboard, whatever, and actually they're getting their output done even faster, right? So they're, they're only working 20, 25 hours a week, but they're getting their 40 hours a week that they were before done. So it's good. And it's been this interesting, well, then they should have more work. They should get more, uh, uh, we should load them up more, load them up more. Do you have a philosophy on like, if people are getting their job, but there's, let's say there's four or five people in a similar role and one person's knocking it out in 25 hours, and the other people are taking the full 40 hours. How do you handle that situation? Because it, is it output based or is it uh, hours based? Well, it depends. I mean, if if people are knocking things out in half the time that they would have in the office, we we kind of start looking at that. We gaze at that pretty hard as well. Um, right. But generally speaking, we look at productivity the same, right? So um, somebody might be more proficient that doesn't mean that they should be punished by having, you know, getting more work put on them, but that's kind of the name of the game, right? So maybe we wouldn't look at that person and then avoid giving them more work. Maybe we'd give them more work, but look into why that other person wasn't as productive uh -huh. and see if there's ways to create more efficiency or productivity with those individuals. Yeah, it's been an interesting challenge for a lot of the people at the, uh, you know, what are you, what are you paying for and how are you going to manage those, uh, those people? So uh, the difference in how the world has worked. I know you're 
really proud of and you've had some, can you just maybe share without naming, don't share names necessarily, but just some people that you've helped by coaching and developing them and you've, you got to watch them move up in their career. Do you have some thoughts that make you smile on that? I have, I have so many and that those are my proudest moments. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I've had the luxury of, of seeing this happen a lot of times. And I, I will tell you that, you know, coaching, the coaching and mentoring piece uh, after being in business for 30 years and skinning my knees and making the mistakes and, um, and, and being across from somebody that's, uh, you know, young and ambitious and doesn't necessarily have the wisdom or the experience yet um, and giving that back um, and, and really, you know, helping them pave the way for their own success, how to approach, uh, how to approach conversations, how to manage their emotional triggers. And we all have those, like, how do we stop ourselves from making that face in that meeting? Because that's not going to work well for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's those sorts of things that, you know, really embrace. Um, and I love to see when people win. Um, even if I played just a little tiny sliver, um, you know, they have the recipe for what's going to be great. It's just the refining. And I think, uh, I think I've had the best mentors and coaches growing up uh, in business, people that cared about me personally, who invested in me, invested in, in growing me. And I think, man, I just, that's what I want to do. I want to give that back too. And I, uh, it makes me very excited when I get the opportunity or if someone asks me for my advice on how to approach something that is, that is fantastic uh, for me. And I, I really enjoy those conversations. I know you do, and it's fun to watch you just light up on that because I know that you're super proud of all those moments that you've uh, really made a difference in people's lives, and it truly is making a difference. And, and the neat thing about coaching, and I know you know this, is you're making a difference not only in their business life, but those skills they're learning transfer across all their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Any part they're at, so about being a better communicator, a better listener, better accountability, that just transfers against everything in your life. It's not just a business thing, which is it's so I, true. It's so true. Yes, absolutely. Well, I appreciate I appreciate the talk, Shelley. I've always appreciated you and what you've done. Um, how would people, if they're interested in learning a little bit more about what you're doing now, how would they get a hold of you? What's the best like the best email address or website? Could you share that? And we'll also have it on a QR code or on a screen so people can get a hold of you watching this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the best way to connect me, uh, connect with me, is probably going to be through email, which my email is Shelley S H E L L I E dot schultz s-c-h-u-l-t-z at coach.com great perfect we will have a little qr code up available too but i appreciate your time today and uh, appreciate you like i said and uh, look forward to more uh, working with you i'm sure in a lot of different ways thanks john i appreciate thanks. the time take care